One of us is lying, chapter six. Cooper, Saturday, September 24th, 4.15 p.m. I squint at the batter. We're at full count and he's fouled off the last two pitches. He's making me work, which isn't good. In a showcase game like this, facing a right-handed second baseman with so-so stats, I should have mowed him down already. Problem is, I'm distracted. It's been a hell of a week. Pops in the stands, and I can picture exactly what he's doing. He'll have taken his cap off, nodding it between his hands as he stares at the mound, like burning a hole into me with his eyes is going to help. I bring the ball into my glove and glance at Luis, who catches for me during regular season. He's on the Bayview High football team too, but got permission to miss today's game so he could so he could be here. He signals a fastball, but I shake my head. I've thrown five already and this guy's figured every one out. I keep shaking Luis off until he gives me the signal I want. Luis adjusts his crouch slightly and we've played together long enough that I can read his thoughts in the movement. Your funeral, man. I position my fingers on the ball, tensing myself in preparation to throw. It's not my most consistent pitch. If I miss, it'll be a big fat softball and this guy will crush it. I draw back and hurl as hard as I can. My pitch heads straight for the middle of the plate and the batter takes an eager triumphant swing. Then the ball breaks dropping out of the strike zone and into Luis's glove. The stadium explodes in cheers and the batter shakes his head like he has no idea, idea what happened. I adjust my cap and try not to look pleased. I've been working on that slider all year. I strike the next hitter out on three straight fastballs. The last one hits 93 the fastest I've ever pitched. Lights out from a, for a lefty. My stats through two innings are three strikeouts, two ground outs, and a long fly that would have been a double if the right fielder hadn't made a diving catch. I wish I could have that pitch back. My curveball didn't curve, but other than that, I feel pretty good about the game. I'm at Petco the Padre Stadium for an invitation only showcase event, which my father insisted I go to even though Simon's memorial service is in an hour. The organizers agreed to let me pitch first and leave early, so I skip my usual post-game routine, take a shower and head out of the locker room with Luis to find Pop. I spot him as someone calls my name. Cooper Clay? The man approaching me looks successful. That's the only way I can think to describe him. Sharp clothes, sharp haircut, just the right amount of a tan, and a confident smile as he holds his hand out to me. Josh Langley with the Padres. I've spoken to your coach a few times. Yes, sir. Pleased to meet you, I say. My father grins like somebody just handed him the keys to a Lamborghini. He manages to introduce himself to Josh without drooling, but barely. Hell of a slider you threw there, Josh says to me. Fell right off the plate. Thank you, sir. Good velocity on your fastball, too. You've really brought that up since the spring, haven't you? I've been working out a lot, I say, building up arm strength. Big jump in a short time, Josh observes, and for a second, the statement hangs in the air between us like a question. Then he claps a hand on my shoulder. Well, keep it up, son. Nice to have a local boy on our radar. Makes my job easy, less travel. He flashes a smile, nods goodbye to my dad and Luis, and takes off. Big jump in a short time. It's true, 88 miles per hour to 93 in a few months is unusual. Pop won't shut up on the way home, alternating between complaining about what I did wrong and 
crowing about Josh Langley. He winds up in a good mood, though, more happy about the Padres scout than upset about someone almost getting a hit off me. Simon's family going to be there? He asks as he pulls up to Bayview High. Pay our respects if they are. I don't know, I answer him. It might be just a school thing. Head off, boys, Pop says. Luis crams his into, his into the pocket of his football jacket, and Pop wraps the steering wheel impatiently when I hesitate. Come on, Cooper, it might be outside, but this is still a service. Leave it in the car. I do as I'm told and get out, but as I run a hand through my hat hair and close the passenger door, I wish I had it back. I feel exposed, and people have already been staring at me enough this week. If it were up to me, I'd go home and spend a quiet evening watching baseball with my brother and Noni, but there's no way I can miss Simon's memorial service when I was one of the last people to see him alive. We start toward the crowd on the football field, and I text Keeley to find out where our friends are. She tells me they're near the front, so we duck under the bleachers and try to spot them from the sidelines. I have my eye on the crowd and don't see the girl in front of me until I almost bump into her. She's leaning, leaning against a post, watching the football field with her hands stuffed into the pockets of her oversized jacket. Sorry, I say, and realize who it is. Oh, hey, Leah. You heading out to the field? Then I wish I could swallow my words because there's no way in hell Leah Jackson's here to mourn Simon. She actually tried to kill herself last year because of him. After he wrote about her sleeping with a bunch of freshmen, she was harassed on social media for months. She slit her wrists in her bathroom and was out of school for the rest of the year. Leah snorts, yeah, right, good riddance. She stares at the scene in front of us, kicking the toe of her boot into the dirt. <sighs> Nobody could stand him, but they're all holding candles like he's some kind of martyr instead of a gossipy douchebag. She's not wrong, but now that doesn't seem like the time to be that honest. Still, I'm not going to try defending Simon to Leah. I guess people want to pay their respects, I hedge. Hypocrites, she mutters, cramming her hands deeper into her pockets. Her expression shifts and she pulls out her phone with a sly look. You guys see the latest? Latest what? I ask with a sinking feeling. Sometimes the best thing about baseball is the fact that you can't check your phone while you're playing. There's another email with a Tumblr update, Leah swipes a few times at her phone and hands it to me. I take it reluctantly and look at the screen as Luis reads over my shoulder. Time to clarify a few things. Simon had a severe peanut allergy, so why not stick up planters into his sandwich and be done with it? I've been watching Simon Kelleher for months. Everything he ate was wrapped in an inch of cellophane. He carried that goddamn water bottle everywhere, and it was all he drank. But he couldn't go ten minutes without swinging from that swigging from that bottle. I figured if it was if it wasn't there, he'd default to plain old tap water. So yeah, I took it. I spent a lot of time figuring out where I could slip peanut oil into one of Simon's drinks, someplace contained without a water fountain, and Mr. Avery's detention seemed like the ideal, ideal spot. I did feel bad watching Simon die. I'm not a sociopath. In that moment, as he turned that horrible color and fought for air, if I could have stopped it, I would have. I couldn't, though, because you see, I'd taken his EpiPen and every last one in the nurse's office. My heart starts hammering and my stomach clenches. The first post was bad enough, but this one? This one's written like the person was actually in the room when Simon had his attack, like it was one of us. Louise snorts, that's fucked up. Leah's watching me closely and I grimace as I hand back the phone. Hope they figure out who's writing this stuff. It's pretty sick. 
She lifts one shoulder in a shrug, I guess. She starts to back away. Have a blast morning, guys. I'm out of here. Bye, Leah. I squelch the urge to follow her and we trudge forward until we hit the 10-yard line. I start shouldering through the crowd and finally find Keeley and the rest of our friends. When I re reach her, she hands me a candle. She lights with her own and loops her arm through mine. Principal Gupta sets up to, steps up to the microphone and taps against it. What a terrible week for, week for our school, she says. But how inspiring to see all of you gathered here tonight. I should be thinking about Simon, but my head's too full of other stuff. Keely, who's gripping my arm a little too tight. Leah, saying the kind of things most people only think. The new Tumblr posted right before Simon's memorial service. And Josh Langley with his flashy smile. Big jump in a short time. That's the thing about competitive edges. Sometimes they're too good to be true. Nate. Sunday, September 30th, 1230 p.m. My probation officer isn't the worst. She's in her 30s, not bad looking, and has a sense of humor. But she's a pain in my ass about school. How did your history exam go? We're sitting in the kitchen for our usual Sunday meeting. Stan's hanging out on the table, which she's fine with since she likes him. My dad is upstairs something I always arrange before Officer Lopez comes over. Part of her job is to make sure I'm being adequately supervised. I lost my place. <laughs> ah, she knew his deal the first time she saw him, but she also knows I've got nowhere else to go and state care can be way worse than alcoholic neglect. It's easier to pretend he's a fit guardian when he's not passed out in the living room. It went, I say. She waits patiently for more. When it doesn't come, she asks, did you study? I've been kind of distracted, I remind her. She'd heard the Simon story from her cop pals, and we spent the first half hour after she got here talking about what happened. I understand, but keeping up with school is important, Nate. It's part of the deal. She brings up the deal every week. San Diego County is getting tougher on juvenile drug offenses, and she thinks I was lucky to get probation. A bad report from her could put me back in front of a pissed-off judge. Another drug bust could land me in juvie, so every Sunday morning before she shows up, I gather up all my unsold drugs and burner phones and stick them in our senile neighbor's shed, just in case. Officer Lopez holds out her palm to Stan, who crawls halfway toward it before he loses interest. She picks him up and lays him across her arm. How has your week been otherwise? Tell me something positive that happened. She always says that, as if life is full of great shit I can store up and report every Sunday. I got to 3000 in Grand Theft Auto. She rolls her eyes. She does that a lot at my house. Something else. What progress have you made toward your goals? Jesus, my goals. She made me write a list at our first appointment. There's not anything I actually care about on there. Just stuff I know she wants to hear about school and jobs and friends, which she's figured out by now I don't have. I have people I go to parties with, sell to, and screw, but I wouldn't call any of them friends. It's been a slow week, goal-wise. Did you look at that Alateine literature I left you? No, I didn't. I don't need a brochure to tell me how bad it sucks when your only parents are drunk, and I definitely don't need to talk about it with a bunch of whiners in a church basement somewhere. Yeah, I lie. I'm thinking about it. I'm sure she sees right through me since she's not stupid, but she doesn't push it. That's good to hear. Sharing experiences with other kids whose parents are struggling would be transformative for you. Officer Lopez doesn't let up. You have to give her that. We could be surrounded by walking dead in the zombie apocalypse and she'd look for the bright side. 
Your brains are still in your head, right? Way to beat the odds. She loved just wants to hear an actual positive thing from me, like how I spent Friday night with Ivy League bound Bronwyn Rojas and didn't disgrace myself. That's not a conversation I need to open up with Officer Lopez. I don't know why I showed up here. I was restless, staring at the Vicodin I had left over after drop off and wondering if I should take a few and see what all the fuss is about. I've never gone down that road because I'm pretty sure it'd end with me comatose in the living room alongside my dad until someone kicked us out for not paying the mortgage. So I went to Bronwyn's instead. I didn't expect her to come outside or invite me in. Listening to her play the piano had a strange effect on me. I almost felt peaceful. How is everyone coping with Simon's death? Have they held the funeral yet? It's today. The school sent an email. I glanced at the clock on our microwave. In about a half an hour, her brows shoot up. Nate, you should go. That would be a positive thing to do. Pay your respects. Gain some closure after a traumatic event. No thanks. She clears her throat and gives me a shrewd look. Let me put it another way. Go to that goddamn funeral, Nate McCauley, or I won't overlook your spotty school attendance the next time I file an update report. I'll come with you. Which is how I end up at Simon Keller's funeral with my probation officer. We're late and St. Anthony's church is packed, so we barely find a space in the last pew. The service hasn't started, but no one's talking. And when the old guy in front of us coughs, it echoes through the room. The smell of incense brings me back to grade school when my mother used to take me to mass every Sunday. I haven't been to church since then, but it looks almost it looks almost exactly the same. Red carpet, shiny dark wood, tall stained glass windows. The only thing that's different is the place is crawling with cops. Not in uniform, but I can tell, and Officer Lopez can too. After a while, some of them look my way, and I get a par and I get paranoid she's led me into some kind of trap. But I don't have anything on me, so why do they keep staring at me? Not only me. I follow their gazes to Bronwyn, who's near the front with her parents, and to Cooper and the blonde girl sitting in the middle with her friend with their friends. The back of my neck tingles and not in a good way. My body tenses, ready to bolt, until Officer Lopez puts a hand on my arm. She doesn't say anything, but I stay put. A bunch of people talk, nobody I know except that goth girl who used to follow Simon everywhere. She reads a, a weird rambling poem and her voice shakes the whole time. The past and present wilt I have filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide to me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly, no one else hears you, and I, set, and I stay only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Will you speak before I am gone? Will you prove already too late? I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runway, runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift, drifted in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Song of Myself Officer Lopez murmurs when the girl finishes. Interesting choice. There's music. More readings, and it's finally over. The priest tells us the burial's going to be private, family only, fine by me. 
I've never wanted to leave any place so bad in my life, and I'm ready to take off before the funeral procession comes down the aisle, but Officer Lopez has her hand on my arm again. A bunch of senior guys carry Simon's casket out the door. A couple dozen people dressed in dark clothes file out, file out after them, ending with a man and a woman holding hands. The woman has a thin, angular face like Simon. She's staring at the door, but as she passes our new our pew, she looks up, catches my eye, and chokes out a furious sob. More, more people crowd the aisles, and someone edges into the pew with Officer Lopez and me. It's one of the plainclothes cops, an older guy with a buzz cut. I could tell right away he's not Bush League like Officer Budapest. He smiles like we've met before. Nate McCauley, he asks. You got a few minutes, son? Chapter 7 Addie Sunday, September 30th, 2.05 p.m. I shade my eyes against the sun outside the church, scanning the crowd until I spot Jake. He and the other pallbearers put Simon's casket onto some kind of metal stretcher, then step aside as the funeral directors angle it toward the hearse. I look down, not wanting to watch Simon's body get loaded into the back of a car like an oversized suitcase, and somebody taps me on the shoulder. Addie Prentice, an older woman dressed in a boxy blue suit, gives me a polite, professional smile. I'm Detective Laura Wheeler, with the Bayview Police. I want to follow up on the discussion you had last week with Officer Budapest about Simon Kelleher's death. Could you come to the station with me for a few minutes? I stare at her and lick my lips. I want to ask why, but she's so calm and assured, like it's the most natural thing in the world to pull me aside after a funeral, that it seems rude to question her. Jake comes up beside me then, handsome in his suit, and gives Detective Wheeler a friendly, curious smile. My eyes dart between them and I stammer, isn't it, I mean, can't we talk here? Detective Wheeler winces, so crowded, don't you think? And we're right around the corner. She gives Jake a half smile. Detective Laura Wheeler, Bayview Police. I'm looking to borrow Addie for a little while and get clarification on a few points related to Simon Kelleher's death. Sure, he says, like that settles things. Text me if you need a ride after ads. Luis and I will stick around downtown. We're starving and we got to talk offensive strategy for next Saturday's game. Going to Glens, probably. So that's it, I guess. I followed the t detective wheeler down the cobblestone path behind the church that leads to the sidewalk even though I don't want to. Maybe this is what Ashton means when she says, I don't think for myself. It's three blocks to the police station and we walk in silence past a hardware store, the post office and an ice cream parlor where a little girl out front is having a meltdown about getting chocolate sprinkles instead of rainbow. I keep thinking I should tell Detective Wheeler that my mother will worry if I don't come straight home, but I'm not sure I could say it without laughing. We pass through metal detectors in the front of the police station and Detective Wheeler leads me straight into the back and into a small overheated room. I've never been inside a police station before and I thought it would be more, I don't know, official looking. It reminds me of a conference room in Principal Gupta's office with worse lighting. The flickering fluorescent tube above us deepens every line on Detective Wheeler's face and turns her skin an unattractive yellow. I wonder what it does to mine. She offers me a drink, and when I decline, she leaves the room for a few minutes, returning with a messenger bag slung over one shoulder and a small, dark-haired woman trailing behind her. Both of them sit across from me at the squat metal table and Detective Wheeler lowers her bag onto the floor. Addie, this is Lorna Shalhoub, a family liaison for the Bayview School District. She's here as an interested adult on your behalf. Now, this is not a custodial interrogation. 
You don't have to answer my questions, and you are free to leave at any time. Do you understand? Not really. She lost me at interested adult. But I say, sure, even though I wish more than ever I'd just gone home or that Jake had come with me. Good. I hope you'll hang in there, hang in here with me. My sense is, of all the kids involved, you're the most likely to have gotten in over your head with no ill intent. I blink at her. No ill what? No ill intent. I want to show you something. She reaches into the bag next to her and pulls out a laptop. Miss Shalhoub and I wait as she opens it and presses a few keys. I suck in my cheeks, wondering if she's going to show me the Tumblr posts. Maybe the police think one of us wrote them as some kind of awful joke. If they ask me who, I guess I'd have to say Bronwyn, because the whole thing sounds like it's written by somebody who thinks they're ten times smarter than everyone else. Detective Wheeler turns the tap laptop so it's facing me. I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but it seems like some kind of blog with the About That logo front and center. I give her a questioning look and she says, this is the admin panel Simon used to manage content for About That. The text below last Monday's date stamp are his latest posts. I lean forward and start to read. First time this app has ever featured good girl BR possessor of school's most perfect academic record, except she didn't get that A in chemistry through plain old hard work, unless that's how you define stealing test from, tests from Mr. C's Google Drive. Someone call Yale. On the opposite end of the spectrum, our favorite criminal, NM, is back to doing what he does best, making sure the entire school is as high as it wants to be. Pretty sure that's a probation violation they're in. MLB plus CC equals a whole lot of green next June, right? Seems inevitable Bayview's Southpaw will make a splash in the major leagues, but don't they have some pretty strict anti-juicing rules? Because CC's performance was most definitely enhanced during showcase season. AP and JR are the perfect couple. Homecoming princess and star running back in love for three years straight, except for that intimate detour A took over the summer with TF at his beach house. Even more awkward now that the guys are friends. Think they compare notes? I can't breathe. It's out there for everyone to see. How? Simon's dead. He can't have published this. Has someone else taken over for him? The Tumblr poster? But it doesn't even matter. The, the how, the why, the when. All that matters is that it is. Jake will see it if he hasn't already. All the things I read before I got to my initials, that shocked me as I realized who they were about and what they meant fall out of my brain. Nothing exists except my stupid, horrible mistake in black and white on the screen for the whole world to read. Jake will know, and he'll never forgive me. I'm almost folded in half with my head on the table and can't make out Detective Wheeler's words at first. Then some start breaking through. Can understand how you felt trapped. Keep this from being published. If you tell us what happened, we can help you, Abby. Only one phrase sinks in. Is this not published? It was queued up the day Simon died, but he never got the chance to post it, Detective Wheeler says calmly. Salvation. Jake hasn't seen this. Nobody has, except this police officer and maybe other police officers. What I'm focused on and what she's focused on are two different things. Detective Wheeler leans forward, her lips stretched in a smile that doesn't reach her eyes. You may already have recognized the initials, but those other stories were about Bronwyn Rojas, so BR, uh, Simon has accused her of um, stealing the tests from uh, teachers' 
Google Drive. So Brahman has been accused of cheating. And um, Nate McCauley, NM, he's the one that they're saying that was, uh, well, Simon was saying, typing, that he's um, he's a drug dealer. Okay, well, which we know that. And then Cooper Clay, CC, he's been accused of juicing, which is um, means uh, taking steroids. Remember, previously they talked about how his uh, pitching went from 80-something to 93 miles an hour in a really short time. So maybe that's what, you know, how he was able to do that. And then, of course, the last one, um, AP, that's Addy, and JR is Jake. And then TF is his, uh, TF is his friend, you remember, she, she said that she... Uh, got, you know, got together with him behind her boyfriend's back. Anyway, whew. Anyway, let me back up a little. Detective Wheeler leans forward, her lips stretched in a smile that doesn't reach her eyes. You may already have recognized the initials, but those other stories were about Bronwyn Rojas, Nate McCauley, and Cooper Clay. The four of you who were in the room with Simon when he died. That's a weird coincidence, I manage. Isn't it? Detective Wheeler agrees. Addie, you already know how Simon died. We vandalized Mr. Avery's room and can't see any way that peanut oil could have gotten into Simon's cup unless someone put it there after he filled it from the tap. There were only six people in the room one of whom is dead. Your teacher left for a long period of time. The four of you who remained with Simon all had reasons for wanting to keep him quiet. Her voice doesn't get any louder, but it fills my ears like buzzing from a hive. Do you see where I'm heading with this? This might have been carried out as a group, but it doesn't mean you share equal responsibility. There's a big difference between coming up with an idea and going along with it. I look at Miss Shaloub. She does look interested, I have to say, but not like she's on my side. I don't understand what you mean. You lied about being in the nurse's office, Addie. Did someone put you up to that? To removing the EpiPen so Simon couldn't be helped later? My heart pounds as I pull a strand of hair off my shoulders and twist it around my fingers. I didn't lie. I forgot. God, what if she makes me take a lie detector test? I'll never pass. Kids your age are under a lot of pressure today, Detective Wheeler says. Her tone is almost friendly, but her eyes are as flat as ever. The social media alone, it's like you can't make a mistake anymore, can you? It follows you everywhere. The court is very forgiving toward impressionable young people who act hastily when they have a lot to lose, especially when they help us uncover the truth. Simon's family deserves the truth, don't you think? I hunch my shoulders and tug at my hair. I don't know what to do. Jake would know, but Jake's not here. I look at Miss Shalhoub, tucking her short hair behind her ears, and suddenly Ashton's voice pops into my head. You don't have to answer any questions. Right. Detective Wheeler said at the beginning, and the words push everything else out of my brain with startling relief and clarity. I'm going to leave now, I say it with confidence, but I'm still not 100% sure I can do that. I stand and wait for her to stop me, but she doesn't. She just narrows her, narrows her eyes and says, of course, as I told you, this isn't a custodial interrogation, but please understand the help I can give you now won't be the same once you leave this room. I don't need your help, I tell her, and walk out the door, then out of the police station. Nobody stops me. Once I'm outside, though, I don't know where to go or what to do. I sit on a bench and pull out my phone, my hands shaking. I can't call Jake, not for this, but who does that leave? My mind's as blank as if Detective Wheeler took an eraser and wiped it clean. I built my entire 
the entire world around Jake. And now to, that it's shattered, I realize way too late that I should have cultivated some other people who'd care that a police officer with mom hair and a sensible suit just accused me of murder. And when I say care, I don't mean in an, oh my God, did you hear what happened to Addie kind of way? My mother would care, but I can't face that much scorn and judgment right now. I scroll to the A's in my contact list and press a name. It's my only option. And I say a silent prayer of thanks when she picks up. Ash, somehow I managed not to cry at my sister's voice. I need help. Cooper, Sunday, September 30th, 2.30 p.m. When Detective Chang shows me Simon's unpublished about that page, I read everyone else's entry first. Bronwyn's shocks me. Nate's doesn't. I have no idea who the hell this TF Addie supposedly hooked up with is, and I'm almost positive I know what's coming for me. My heart pounds as I spy my initials because CC's performance was most definitely enhanced during showcase season. Uh, my pulse slows down as I lean back in my chair. That's not what I expected. Although I guess I shouldn't be surprised. I improved too much too quickly. Even the Padre Scout said something. Detective Chang dances around the subject for a while, dropping hints until I understand he thinks the four of us who were in the room planned the whole thing to keep Simon from posting his update. From posting his update. I try to picture it. Me, Nate, and the two girls plotting murder by peanut oil in Mr. Avery's detention. It's so stupid, it wouldn't even make a good movie. I know I'm quiet for too long. Nate and I never even spoke before last week, I finally say. And I sure as heck never talked to the girls about this. Detective Chang leans almost halfway across the table. You're a good kid, Cooper. Your record's spotless till now, and you've got a bright future. You made one mistake, and you got caught. That's scary, I get that. But it's not too late to do the right thing. I'm not sure which mistake he's referring to. My alleged juicing, my alleged murdering, or something we haven't talked about yet. But as far as I know, I haven't been caught at anything, just accused. Bronwyn and Addie are probably getting the exact same speech somewhere. I guess Nate would get a different one. I didn't cheat, I told Detective Chang, and I didn't hurt Simon. Ah, didn't. I can hear my accent coming back. He tries a different tack. Whose idea was it to use the planted cell phones to get all of you into detention together? I lean forward, palms pressed on the black wool of my good pants. I hardly ever wear, wear them and they're making me hot and itchy. My heart's banging against my chest again. Listen, I don't know who did that, but it isn't something you should look, but isn't it something you should look into? Like, were there fingerprints on the phones? Because it feels to me like maybe we were framed. The other guy in the room, some representative from the Bayview School District who hasn't said a word, nods like I said something profound. But Detective Chang's expression doesn't change. Cooper, we examined those phones as soon as we started to suspect foul play. There's no forensic evidence to suggest anyone else was involved. Our focus is on the four of you. And that's where I expect it to remain. Which finally gets me to say, I want to call my parents. The want part isn't true, but I'm in over my head. Detective Chang heaves a sigh like I've disappointed him, but he says, all right, you have your cell phone with you? When I nod, he says, you can make the call here. He stands in the room while I call Pop, who catches on a lot faster than I did. Give me that detective you're talking to, he spits, right now, in Cooperstown. Wait, Cooper, hold up. Don't you say another goddamn word to anyone. I hand Detective Chang my phone and he puts it to his ear. I can't hear anything Pops is saying, but he's loud enough that I get the basic idea. 
Detective Chang tries to insert a few words along the lines of how it's perfectly legal to question minors in California without their parents present, but mostly he lets Pop rant. At one point he says, no, he's free to go, and my ears prick up. It hadn't occurred to me that I could leave. Detective Chang gives me gives my phone back and Pop's voice crackles in my ear. Cooper, you there? Get your ass home. They're not charging you with anything and you're not going to answer any more questions without me and a lawyer. A lawyer? Do I actually need one of those? I hang up and face Detective Chang. My father told me to leave. You have that right, Detective Chang says, and I wish I'd known that from the beginning. Maybe he told me. I honestly don't remember. But Cooper, these conversations are happening all over the station with your friends. One of them is going to agree to work with us, and that person will be treated very differently from the rest of you. I think it should be you. I'd like you to have that chance. I want to tell him he's got it all wrong, but Pop told me to stop talking. I can't bring myself to leave without saying anything, though. So I end up shaking Detective Chang's hand and saying, Thank you for your time, sir. I sound like the ass kisser of the century. It's years of conditioning kicking in. Woo. Well, um, as I've told you in previous videos, you need to stop at each chapter. You can pause it at any time and um, write an objective summary, which is just, just the facts, and um, ask some questions, any questions you might have. You can write those down, and then add any interesting or unknown words to, your, to a word list uh, for later review so that you can look them up later if you need to. Um, we're preparing for a literary analysis. So by the time you finish reading this book, um, you're going to take your notes and then you're going to uh, turn them into uh, a, a literary analysis. You're going to just give a summary of the book and then you'll point out some interesting points and you'll use some uh, facts from the book to support your claim. And, and by the time we get to that point, I'll help you with that. Okay. Um, see you next time. Stay tuned for chapter eight.